Hi everyone, I'm Jennifer Chu, the Center for Asian American Media's Membership Manager. On behalf of everyone at CAM, thank you for joining us for day three of CAMFest Online Heritage at Home. This festival would not be possible without the incredible support of our wonderful sponsors, supporters, members, and all of you. If you aren't currently a CAM sustaining member, I hope you'll consider joining at our website, cammedia.org. Or you're welcome to contact me following today's program and I'd be happy to tell you more. We would also like to thank the wonderful organizations who are co-presenting today's program and have helped us get the word out. They are Chinese for Affirmative Action, Seek American Legal Education Defense Fund, and Bay, um, Bay Area Video Coalition, and Asian American Documentary Network. Let's give a virtual round of applause for everybody. Uh, I'm really excited to have um, join us today some of the incredible people who made Yi Chen's documentary first vote. In 2018, CAMS Media Fund awarded the film the Documentary Fund Award, and the film is fresh off its world premiere at the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival. So with us today is a film director, Yi Chen, and two of the subjects, Jennifer Ho and Kaiser Kuo. Yi Chen is a Washington DC based filmmaker whose work explores the intersection of racial justice, immigration and democracy. Jennifer Ho, the director, the center of the Center for Humanities and the Arts, the University of Colorado Boulder, where she also serves as a professor in the ethnic studies department. Kaiser Guo hosts the Seneca podcast, and he's also a writer, musician, former executive with Baidu, and an active democratic activist in North Carolina. So I'd like to welcome Yi, Jennifer, and Kaiser um, to today's conversation. It's so great to finally meet you all. So the way the conversation will work is that I will start off with a few questions for our guests, and then I will open it up to your questions. We probably won't have time to address all of the questions that you submit, but we will do our best to address as many as we can. If you haven't already done so, I encourage you to submit your questions using the box below the screen. And with that, I will get started with my first question to Yi. So Yi, I was a political science major, proud political science major at UC Davis back in the day. So films like yours and other and film, other films that Kind of explore in depth the kind of democratic process, voter behavior, and voter participation really fascinate me. And I really loved your film and how how many topics you covered and the just the diverse range of, of subjects that you included. Can you tell us more about how what drew you to the subject, what inspired you to make the film, and a little bit more about the filmmaking process and even um, locating your subjects? Yeah, thanks for having me, Jennifer, and uh, thanks, Kim, for supporting the film um, very early on. Um, yeah, so I am an immigrant. Um, I was born and grew up in Shanghai, and I was um, becoming a naturalized citizen back in 2017 when I first started the project. Um, so I've always been interested, um, coming from a country where, um, you know, I've never voted before, um, and a country without democracy. I, you know, I've always been interested in um, how democracy work here in the United States. Um, so particularly um, in 2016, um, you know, I noticed this rise of the Chinese Americans for, for Trump movement um, and how it um, really divided um, our community on a very personal level. So I read Kaiser's article of how it affected um, his family um, so yeah, I became interested in um, this, uh, this um, subject of um, voters in my own community and their civic engagement and participation. Um, so I, you know, I wanted to find characters in, um, in battleground states and I wanted to um, find uh, characters from uh, both sides um, of the both parties. Um, so that's that's how the project got started. Um, I find Kaiser because of the article he wrote. Um, 
And um, I think I messaged him on LinkedIn um, out of blue. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, I found Jennifer actually through uh, a Kim um, uh, hosted event. Um, oh. Yeah, Asian American storytelling in the South. And she oh. uh, was uh, one of the, the speakers. Um, and the other two characters, um, so Sue Guj, um, she was already known in, um, in, in the community. She ran for Congress in 2016. So I started asking around people and heard about her. Um, so yeah, and, and I, I got on those WeChat groups and started um, going to um, their events and started talking to people. Um, and there are a few of them told me that they listened to this podcast by this, um, this guy in Ohio. So I, yeah, they're, they're all like, you should, you know, you should interview him. So, so I reached out to him. Um, yeah, so that's how I found the, the four characters. I think what is really um, compelling and fascinating about these four characters is that they are all very um, passionate and very engaged um, in what they do and in very different ways. Um, so as you saw in the film, Lance has a podcast and, you know, um, and Jennifer teaches um, critical race theory, Asian Americans in the South. Um, she's an educator and Sugu, she ran for office. Um, and Kaiser, you know, she moved back in 2016 and she he felt very strongly about um the rise of the chinese american for child movement and he was very actively doing uh phone banking and door knocking um so I, I think i was very lucky to find these four very compelling characters that are doing like very different things Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that was one thing that I find most fascinating about the film is just the incredible, just the background and the experience and everything that each character brings to it and how you were able to represent different um, views along the political spectrum. I really respect that. And I think that it's important for people to understand that. And so thank you for sharing more of that background with us. I think my next question, speaking of characters, I'm gonna throw it to Jennifer and Kaiser. I would love to learn more about your experience being part of this film and what you think now that you have seen it and while we're in this kind of um, interesting climate. After you, Jennifer. Well, I no longer live in North Carolina. And so when I saw the film, again, and now that I live in Boulder, I realized something which is that I, I subconsciously pulled some punches that I wasn't actually as maybe fervent and passionate as I would be now being outside of the US South and outside of North Carolina. And I say that in no way to disrespect people in the US South or my time in, in Chapel Hill, um, that was instrumental, but there's a segment where I talk about the North Carolina legislators. And in hindsight, I realized that I was really conscious of these film perhaps being viewed by um, donors of UNC Chapel Hill and that those donors would be really unhappy with some things that I would say and that that could have, um, that could have ramifications for me as a university professor. And I realized that I had, I had internalized this kind of self-censoring. And so watching myself in Yi's film was really interesting to realize that, that I had just internalized so much self-censoring from my time being at UNC Chapel Hill and being in the US South. And so that, that kind of made me sad actually, because um, I actually believe that while, while I, I agree with everything I said in the film, I do believe that the GOP is a party of white supremacy. Um, and I don't make that accusation lightly, but I think that all of the evidence around us, especially what's happening now, really suggests that it has doubled down on a platform of white supremacy. Yeah, my, my feelings watching the film were uh, that my wife was a whole lot more compelling of a character in it and uh, had really a lot more interesting things to say than I did. 
And uh, I wish that she were able to, to join this, this conversation. But uh, part of what makes her so interesting is that she had a positive aversion to politics. It wasn't even just an aversion. She was anti-political, not just apolitical. Uh, she was so uh, resolutely opposed to involving herself in any way in the political life of this country because she really has never intended to be an immigrant. She believes herself to be something of a sojourner here. We're here for a number of years while our children get an education. And then as far as she's concerned, it's back to China for, at least for her. Um, I'm not so sure about that myself, but we'd, we'd been in China for 20 years um, and she was shielded in a lot of ways from this. You know, uh, most of that time, I mean, uh, the eight, uh, eight solid years of that was um, during the Obama pr presidency and, uh, you know, she didn't see me up in arms and angry and, and feeling extremely emotional, except in a positive way about what was happening in American politics. And so the election of Trump, I mean, it was presaged by when we landed a few days later, we were still in an Airbnb. We hadn't moved into our place yet. Um, the Brexit had happened. And it, it really sort of put the fear of God into me. I sort of realized that there was something going on. And it was actually her who, who, uh, turn, sort of alerted me to something that was happening in the Chinese American community, uh, especially of recent immigrants. And if there's any regret that I have about the film, it's that, you know, I came to realize during it, and I hope that I said it during interviews of the film, uh, that it really, what was happening, the, the surge of support among recent immigrants uh, of a certain age for Trump was so much more about uh, what was happening in China than what was happening in the United States, ultimately, that it really reflected the sort of uh, ethos of, of brutal, almost sort of social Darwinian competition that was happening there, that I am going to screw you before you get the chance to screw me. I, I'll do whatever I need to do to get myself and my family ahead. Uh, it, it was this that I think was, was giving rise to so much of uh, the shift that she had observed. And so I, I got really interested in that and it caused problems for her. I mean, I was, you know, writing about this and speaking about it and she was having difficulty connecting with people in the community because she came to realize that uh, politics were an expression of values, of character, and that uh, the ugliness of, of the ugly aspects of that character, which she recognized as ugly, that sort of, uh, selfishness, that lack of civic mindedness, that, that, uh, that, that, uh, you know, that particular manifestation of an authoritarian tendency was repulsive to her, but she at the same time didn't want that to be something that prevented her from making friends. So it was a real conundrum for her. And so I think she, ultimately she was a much more interesting character in it. Uh, thank you both for sharing and Kaiser, I thought you were, I mean, I think all of the characters were all very fascinating and interesting. And thank you both for sharing kind of your, your backstory and how you got involved with the film. We've actually received a lot of questions just in the last few minutes. So I, Great. I'm going to throw, I'm going to start um, with the questions from our wonderful audience. So the first question is from Toby. They ask, thanks for making this documentary. It's so rare to find a deep dive into this segment of our political landscape. Oh, how did you go about finding the subjects? How did you persuade them to participate? So Yi, I don't know if you want to elaborate on your explanation earlier. Well, maybe we can all talk about why we were, we felt like we should participate. I mean, I, I really wanted a chance to, uh, to out, these the, the people on the other side it wasn't about getting my point across this i was really eager to see uh to see them be given enough rope so they could dutifully hang themselves with their you know uh their racism and all the other vile uh deplorable and i'll use that word happily deplorable attributes i think they were clearly manifested but i think he was gentle uh many times during the interviews i would ask her uh so, so did they ask you to turn the camera off and, and uh, then go on to say overtly racist things? 
And did you, and, and yeah, they did. And she admitted that to me. And I said, would you say that out loud on camera in, in the hopes that that'll make it into the documentary? But I mean, I, I wish that had come out a little bit more strongly. Um, I really respect how Yi was gentle with them in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, Jennifer's talked about her own self-censoring, but I, I wish that they hadn't engaged in that same level of self-censorship uh, and had allowed the sort of uh, loathsome, truly uh, ugly uh, drivers of, of their own racist attitudes to, to, to show themselves. I, I actually didn't know that I was going to be a subject in Yee's film. And I know oh. that sounds, <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but um, you know, when Yee came, approached me at the um, CAM Stories in the South event, she pitched the film to me as, you know, it was going to follow three characters, two of whom were um, Republicans, conservatives, Trump supporters, one of whom was not, was a Democrat, that was Kaiser. Um, and she just had some questions about immigration, Asian American history. So we started with just talking. And then she was going to come to Chapel Hill to film Sue and Kaiser. She asked, could I, you know, could I film you? So I just thought I was going to be like this occasional talking head, Ken Burns style professor who came on to kind of elaborate on what the Immigration Act of 1965 was. And um, you would think I would have been smarter, but then by the number of times that you came and filmed me that I would have a bigger presence in the film, but it wasn't until <laughs> I saw the film and I saw, well, it wasn't until I, I, I saw that I was one of four images used to, to promote first vote. And I was like, oh, maybe I have a bigger role in this than I think. And then when I saw the film, I was like, oh, I'm in the film, so. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I actually met Jennifer actually a year. So I started the project in uh, January 2017, and I met Jennifer um, in February 2018. So um, it was a, actually a year, after, actually six months after I started production. Um, so at that time, you know, I was really looking for um, a connection, a deeper connection between all three characters. And, um, and Jennifer's classes, um, you know, they they really completed the story and they really connected all the stories together. Um, this underlying theme, you know, of identity and of race. Um, and I really appreciate that Jennifer and Kaiser, you know, they let me um, follow them for two years and they invited me um, to their homes and I had lunch and dinner with them. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I really, um, I really appreciate that. Um, it's, it's a quite involved um, process. Um, and yeah, I started the film exploring um, the, the divide in the community. Um, but you know, what I ended up walking away with is, um, and all four characters express this in the film to, in the end as well, that um, you know, they have this sheer desire that they want to belong and they want to be American. Um, so that was something that unexpected, but that actually, you know, gave me um, a hope that, you know, there is a possibility, there is an opportunity for moving forward to find ways to have a conversation, um, to, you know, build bridges and find ways to find common ground. And I think that's what we need for our community common ground huh <laughs> well yeah that's so amazing and i do i mean i'm gonna continue with the questions that have been submitted because there have been a lot um but that was one thing that really stood out for me at the end of the film was just how authentically all of the characters and subjects really want and feel strongly about being american um it was really inspiring to me to see that even if i don't necessarily agree with all of them i i can still empathize with that so um i'm gonna ask the next question. It's from Melody. Um, she asks, as a Filipina American living in the South, uh, I have family relatives who remind me of Lance. How do I speak to them about their own entitledness when they dismiss undocumented immigrants and simultaneously dismiss their own roots? Also, um, Jennifer, what are some of your latest book recommendations within ethnic studies? All you, Jennifer. Um, well, I I'll actually defer the first part of the question to Kaiser or Yi, um, but I would say 
that something that I think is really essential reading um, is the Ian Haney Lopez White by Law. And I know that it, it's a little theoretical, um, but it really talks about the process by which whiteness became solidified with ideas of Americanness. Um, and it, it also really kind of talks about immigration and naturalization, which can help in dealing with relatives because this whole idea that there are, there's a legal path and an illegal path is just, um, it's a binary that doesn't exist. Um, and then can I also just pr promote one lovely novel by Monique Trong called Bitter in the Mouth, which takes place in Boiling Springs, North Carolina in the US South. And that's, if you wanna read about Asian Americans in the US South, it's a magnificent novel. Hmm. So there's the advice that I would give, uh, you know, ideally that I would suggest that we exercise empathy, a real cognitive empathy. We understand their own life experiences, their own, uh, perspectives and how they, those were forced by often, you know, that we don't, we don't chalk it all up to flaws in character or, uh, but then there's also, I mean, and, and I think there's a lot to it. And I, I, that's what I would, I would say. And, and if I may add a book recommendation, I think strangers in their own land is a, a very fine book, uh, written by a UC Berkeley anthropologist who tries to sort of, you know, get inside communities in Southern Louisiana understand why these people seem to be voting against their own economic interests. These are people whose lands and lives were devastated by environmental catastrophes uh, related to the petroleum industry, and yet who consistently vote in favor of uh, deregulation and who are opposed to environmental regulation in any form, uh, and, and who were you know, activists in some cases for the Tea Party and who voted for Trump. So that's a very, very good book. Um, I am incapable of that at this point, though. I, I really don't, I can't exercise that empathy. Uh, I feel like I have almost no common reality with you know, your uncle who is like Lance. And I would say, that, you know, I, the, the way I would, I carve those people out of my life often, or because sometimes it's just an insurmountable chasm. And I will often, uh, I, I would suggest that, you know, you just simply arm yourself with, you know, fact with understanding that but understanding also that that side is often completely deaf to fact that you know it is so it has gotten so dogmatically anti-intellectual that uh, the more fact you, you wield the, the more you, you are now part of of this sort of elite uh academic establishment that is opposed to you know the real america or whatever so i no i it's 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 an extremely difficult Thing. I mean, there's a polarization is what it is in this country for a reason. And I don't think that, you know, holding hands and singing Kumbaya is going to do a damn thing about it right now. I think defeating them electorally is, is the only path forward right now. Oh, oh yeah, I, I would recommend, um, I would recommend uh, Ian Haney Lopez new book, Merge Left, um, which is a wonderful book. Um, I, I mean, I hope that the, and thank you for the question. I've actually been getting this feedback um, uh, quite often from audience that they have family members, um, uh, older generation who are actually Republicans. And so I, you know, I'm actually happy to see that the film could in a way open up that generational dialogue. Um, and um, I think a lot of it is really, I think it will take time um, and I think that um, a film like this and a film like the PBS Asian American series to understand um, Asian American history that we all share, that we're all part of, um, that we are, um, you know, we're not white, um, and understand um, the power of Asian Americans, that we are the fastest growing population and we have 11 million eligible voters this year. Um, but we are still underrepresented in Congress. Um, and um, our, we are still, you know, the lowest voter turnout group. Um, but we do have that power. Um, we're growing. Um, so, you know, understand the power we have. And um, I hope the film will inspire and activate um, AAPI um, civic engagement. And also, Quote Jennifer, um, you know, the first step to um, 
the first step is to talk about race and feel comfortable talk about race. I, I do remember um, that, um, you know, that she told me that and, you know, I was asking her, so what can we do to fight racism, right? So understand, um, you know, that we are not honorary white being part of the whiteness and, and who we are as Asian Americans and understand our history. Okay, I really hate to start to wind down this conversation. It's been really fascinating um, for everybody, it seems like. So we've received so many questions, but we only have, and thank you all for sharing um, these answers. We have one, we have time for one last question. And I think I'm gonna address it to all of you and it's gonna be an adapted version of a question that was submitted, but what are your recommendations for how we can address the rise in intensification in um, uh, racism against Asians and Asian Americans and other communities of color since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, but we only have a few, few minutes, I'm sorry, but I think we'll wrap it up with that one. Can I, can I start? Jennifer, so yeah. if you look at my, um, if you look at my name on my Zoom, where it says there's my Twitter handle at Dr. Jen Ho. And if you go to my Twitter feed, the pinned tweet has a link to a PowerPoint presentation in video form. And you can also fill out a Google form and I will email you a PowerPoint slide deck that talks about anti-Asian racism and COVID-19. So ever since I created that PowerPoint and I did that to address this question that I kept seeing, which is people asking, why can't I say Chinese virus? Why is saying Wuhan virus racist when it emerged out of Wuhan, China? So I decided to take that question seriously and think that there were people who really didn't understand why you should not be saying Chinese virus in the year 2020 and why it is racist. And so I created that PowerPoint slide deck. Um, and you know, I think the other thing I'll just say is if you're going to advocate for anti-Asian racism or against, I should say, anti-Asian racism, like if you identify as Asian American, one of the things you also need to know is you need to be an anti-racism advocate for everyone. So you need to be standing up for anti-Black racism um, or against, I should say, again, like you need to be thinking about what's happening in the indigenous populations in the United States and the rates of COVID-19 that are decimating um, various American Indian communities. Um, you need to think about the Latinx children that are being held in cages still on the U.S. southern border. Um, this is all intertwined. So I would, I hope that this sparks a generation of Asian American activists who then become anti-racism activists. I would want to, to help people to understand that a lot of uh, what's happening to AAPIs in, in the United States is collateral damage uh, that is really the result of a deeper and more entrenched problem, which is the, the decline of U.S.-China relations, that this is a foreign policy problem, uh, quintessentially, and that that itself has a very, very important racial dimension to it, that there is, this is the first time that the United States has faced a multidimensional peer competitor, uh, which is very much on track to surpass the United States as the most wealthy uh, country in, in, on this planet, it's, it's nothing the United States has ever faced before. Uh, this is causing a deep psychological uh, problem for a country that it prides itself. I mean, it speaks openly of its own exceptionalism that, you know, where its own ideas about history are so deeply teleological, where it has uh, so much hubris that it exercises. It's so used to being uh, on top of a hierarchy of nations, it regards itself as indispensable. Um, that, you know, this problem is not going to be solved until we, we really improve the relationship between China and the United States. And I, I, so I would really recommend that we think through those dimensions of it as well. That, you know, we cannot just think of this as an Asian American problem, that this has a geopolitical dimension to it. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer and Kaiser, for your really in-depth and awesome answers to those questions. And I'm afraid that we have to cut to, to wrap this up. But before we do, Yi, tell us how our, how our audiences can learn more about this film and continue the conversation with you and 
with everyone else on um, Jennifer and Kaiser and where the film is going to be showing next or broadcast. Um, yeah, so um, our social media is First Vote Film on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So please um, follow us. We'll be posting um, future screenings. And our website is firstvotefilm.com. Um, so sign up on our newsletter. And we have um, resources. And we have a um, screening page um, as well um, for future screenings and for community organizations that want to host virtual screenings um, for their um, for their community members. Great, thank you so much. And, I, um, and Kaiser, Jennifer, can folks find you online like you have mentioned during this uh, chat? Yeah, I mean, my name is just my name, Kaiser Guo at Cynic, I mean, at, uh, uh, at on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me on Facebook. I'm very active on Facebook as well. But uh, most importantly, uh, subscribe to the Seneca podcast. It's a weekly in-depth conversation about uh, China and the United States mostly, but uh, all about current affairs in China. And you can just follow me at my Twitter handle at Dr. Jinho. Okay. Thank you all three of you so much. It was really a pleasure to meet you and to chat with you and to have this, this space. And we're looking forward to continuing these conversations. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank, you. thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us. Please stick around. There are five more days of CAMFest online. Check out the website, camfest.com, and we will see you next week.